You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former Conservative special adviser Salma Shah. They'll be with us from now until uh, just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Metro leads with the chaos on the M20 as police continue their hunt for Daniel Khalif, who escaped from prison on Wednesday. <clears throat> The Eye reports on an investigation into the possibility the prison escape was an inside job. The Guardian also leads on that story, writing that the escape has led to a row over prison cuts. While the Daily Telegraph leads on Rishi Sunak refusing to offer more work and student visas to India in exchange for a trade deal. One year on from the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the Daily Mirror runs a message from King Charles. Thank you for your love. Meanwhile, the FT focuses on the expected 8% rise in state pensions as a result of the government's triple lock. The Express says the triple lock is under threat unless the retirement age is raised. The Times writes that police are investigating an alleged cover-up of more than 1,700 cases of avoidable harm at Nottingham University Hospitals Trust. And the Daily Star reports on claims Sir Ken Dodd is haunting his old house. Their headline, Doddy didn't become a ghost, did he? Um, I think you had to uh, know who Ken Dodd was to, to get that uh, reference there. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by the columnist and broadcaster, Steve Richards, and the former Conservative Special Advisor, Salma Shah. Welcome to you both. Um, let us start with the Metro. Uh, their headline, uh, Motorway Chaos in Hunt for terror spy this in reference to the manhunt for daniel khalif uh, salma take us into this story Yes, so this is giving us a little bit of detail about the lengths at which um, uh, authorities are going to in order to locate this escaped terror suspect and that there are long queues of lorries that are forming outside the M20 uh, as extra security checks are causing delays in search for him. Um, so obviously giving you a scale, sense of scale of uh, what this actually involves to try and locate him. But still, what is interesting is that the Metropolitan Head of Counterterrorism, Dominic Murphy, has warned that he could be anywhere in the country at the moment. So um, there doesn't seem to be any cause for celebration yet. No, indeed. Uh, and the Telegraph also on this story suggesting that the uh, missing terror suspect may have had help. This is a, a quote from a detective. Steve. Yeah, well, you can see it's why it's on so many front pages, because there are so many levels to it. On one level, it's a, a, a worrying and alarming story. On another, it has a sort of James Bond kind of element to it, the chase, no one knows where this person is. I thought those lorry queues were another Brexit story at first, but <laughs> it, it's, it, it's not. Um, and then there is speculation about how it happened and whether there are deeper causes, like the funding of prisons and so on, or whether, as uh, The Telegraph puts it, the sp suspect may have had inside help. And nobody knows for sure, because nobody knows very much at all about how this happened and where he is. Um, and while that remains the case, it's going to be a big story, and then the implications will be explored as well. Mm, and some a major headache for the government. Yeah, huge. And it's, it's very difficult because they need to investigate uh, at the moment to understand what has actually happened. And there seems to be some failures indeed in terms of the process of where he was actually placed uh, in, in a Category B prison as opposed to a Category A. So we are actually going to have to try and locate the cause of this, but regardless, it's going to have to be a government minister who walks out and takes the flak for it. Yes, and, and as you say, that the category of prison is likely to pay a, a huge uh, question in, as to why and he just was Just very quickly, it's another story, I know we're going to look at another in this review, of who is in control of what and who is ultimately responsible. And it's fascinating, when a prisoner escapes, you know, in the past, a Home Secretary has been under pressure to resign when a prisoner mm. escapes. But who ultimately takes these decisions? It's never clear in these stories. It's one of the kind of issues about 
who really is in control of public services in Britain at the moment? Mm. Well, we'll find the answer out to that as this story develops over the coming days and this manhunt uh, continues. The, the eye looking at it from the point of view that um, the suggestion that it's an inside... EasyJet's big orange sale is now on. With up to 20% off flights. And up to £200 off package holidays. But hurry, our sale won't be around for long. Get out there. Job. Yeah, and this is interesting because they're saying that the government is actively investigating whether or not he was helped by staff or fellow inmates. Now, at this point, given that we have no leads, it seems, as to where he might be in the country, it is perfectly reasonable for the government to look at all options. I'm not sure that we should be looking at this as a, as a potential answer, but that the government is actually trying to ascertain where he is and whether this could lead to any more information. Mm, but, but, Steve, obviously they're looking at all options because there's, there's little yeah, that's known but, at this point. But because it's not at all clear. And then uh, they will have to explore some of the wider implications of whether he was in the wrong unit and all the other things and who took that decision and why and who was accountable to who. The question at the heart, usually, of all these stories. To the FT and uh, possible Tory autumn by-elections. Well, we know now that there definitely will be. Salma. Yes, well, uh, it's amazing because, actually, it's a small story on the front page of the FT, and I think there's going to be more on the insides of the newspapers, but this is about Chris Pincher, who you will remember um, was the MP who uh, has had to resign over a groping row, which has triggered this by-election. But this is another headache for Rishi Sunak because it's a long line of by-elections that he really doesn't need at this point in the electoral cycle. But as I'm sure Steve is, is thinking about as well, this is going to be a real litmus test. And we were talking earlier that Tamworth, actually, you covered this when it changed hands yeah, to Labour in 97. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, potentially a big um, a bellwether, as they say, for yeah. the election. There was a by-election there in the build-up to 1997, and Labour gained it. And it was seen as another example of Labour moving to power, as it will be this time, if they were to gain it. No-one knows in advance. But that's why sometimes by-elections don't really matter very much. But I've got a feeling the ones this autumn do and will really set the scene and determine the mood. Um, if Labour gain Tamworth, as the Tories must fear, uh, there's another really important one in Nadine Doris's old seat where actually all three parties are battling out. There's a huge one in Scotland, Rutherglen, and I think these will determine the mood of the kind of autumn as much as some of the other things that will be talked about, the party conferences, autumn statements and things. They, these are big mood setters, these by-elections. Mm, and uh, Salma, Rishi Sunak has already admitted that he's slightly nervous about these uh, by-elections coming, coming up. Yeah, and I think that's sensible expectation management from a Prime Minister that knows that he's going to be on the back foot for this. Let's move on to the Times. Um, this story about the uh, Nottingham NHS um, Trust, the maternity scandal, as it's been reported, the uh, cover-up of uh, baby deaths being investigated by police. Steve? Yeah, well, this is really interesting again, and it's the same theme, obviously a very different story as the prisons, in that you try and try and work out who is responsible for what. I found it very interesting with the whole let be affair, reading the emails of surgeons to managers, managers to other managers in the uh, Chesterfield, uh, the Chester Hospital. Mm. And it wasn't really clear who was in control, who was taking command of that crisis as it, as it clearly was, although some people didn't accept it. Um, and here again we have another police investigation in another part of the uh, NHS. Um, and I think we will find the same themes emerging again. Uh, was there a cover-up? What form was the cover-up? Who was involved in it if there was one? If it wasn't a cover-up, was it incompetence? In which case, it, it's, it's these same questions whirling around these big institutions in Britain. Um, and, you know, we've both worked at the BBC. Whenever there's a BBC crisis, it's very hard to identify who precisely is responsible for what. And I think this is kind of whirling around all these stories. Mm. And, and, Salma, the police are going to be working alongside uh, Donna Ockenden, um, senior midwife, who, who's um, carrying out this 
review. So it's, it's all encompassing. She's investigating the maternity services at the Trust. Yeah, she is. And what's, but what's interesting about this is obviously this is uh, looking back as a consequence as well in some, uh, in some ways of, of the Let Be Affair. Um, but the numbers that we're talking about is that it, the Nottingham Trust is accused of failing potentially 1,700 families in this case. So you, you would expect it to be all-encompassing. What's also interesting is that they are investigating in particular um, whether staff have breached a duty of candour. Now, you can put a lot of regulations on people, but as Steve says, once you get into a complex institution, actually, does any of this regulation mm -hmm. actually matter? Does it make a difference? And I think that is something that we actually need to learn about the way that these structures are working or mm. not, as the case may be. We've just got time to fit in uh, this on the front of the... Telegraph, uh, and this is Rishi Sunak um, as we speak on his way to India, um, and it's the likelihood of how the, the trade talks will, will pan out. He's not going to offer more employment or more visas to India, we read. Yeah, uh, well, he, that's, that's the, a sort of pitch at this point mm -hmm. in a negotiation. Um, I suspect in the end the deal will include visas because uh, that's something that uh, India will want. Um, but this is a sort of briefing. It's very interesting when prime ministers travel, their uh, spin doctors have to brief, as you know very well, um, <laughs> stories. And the story he wants, clearly at the moment, is going to be tough to sort of please his right-wingers who are already worried post-Brexit people are coming from other parts of the world. Um, but I wouldn't be at all surprised at the end of that deal the visas play a part, not least because, in many cases, the kind of people that uh, Britain needs at the moment could be met by mm. people coming over from India. But, but, so, but that's clearly what they want on the front page of The Telegraph tomorrow. Mm. But, Salma, is that um, going to appease those to the, to the right of the party, of, of which we, we have uh, Suella Bravman uh, listed as one who's opposed to, you know, more, more visas and extensions of that? I think the problem with coming out and sort of trying to be tough in a negotiation is that it's fine to be tough in a negotiation, but ultimately, if visas are going to be a concession, you're going to have some very upset people on the right wing of the Conservative Party. So he set expectations very high, mm. and if he doesn't meet them, there's going to be a backlash to it. And saying that as well, you know, I worked on visa policy in the Home Office. It is inextricably linked with economic policy. And in mm. this piece, the Prime Minister says immigration policy is going to sit outside of that. Well, we're, all, we're talking about economic migration, we're talking about growth. These things have to be part of a trade deal. Mm. It was always expected that these would be part of a trade deal. So I think it is slightly pushing the boundaries on, on the reality of the situation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Michelle. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, the economist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former Conservative special advisor Salma Shah. Let's have a look at the front page of the Financial Times and this story about uh, pensions. The Treasury is preparing to increase the state pension by more than 8% next year because of the controversial triple lock pledge, which has um, raised retirees' incomes faster than workers' wages. Steve, take us into this story. Yeah, it, it's one of those interesting things. The triple lock is bonkers uh, in that it guarantees these big increases for pensions. The FT re reminds us that the state pension rose by 10.1% the year before this new pay rise. And Just everyone... Ex explain again what the triple lock is. It is locks it... in um, the uh, pension rate, uh, the rather locks it does as well, mm -hmm. um, on the basis of uh, wage growth at a certain point. And it is always the most generous possible rise you can get um, each year. And, of course, it's a universal rise. Lots of pensions are very well off, don't need it, and getting it. Um, everyone knows it's bonkers, and no-one knows how to break it. Labour, who are, you know, projecting fiscal caution, uh, you know, in, 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 in a way that makes um, Sunak seem profligate at times, uh, are committed to the triple lock, uh, even though they know it's bonkers. Um, and the reason being, of course, is pensioners vote. Mm. And no one dares go, especially in a pre-election period, dares to challenge it. Although I noticed you reported the Express saying, if this is going to continue, the pension will have to start at a later working age. It's very expensive, and, uh, but no one can work out how to end it. 
Yeah, because so the pension of the electoral rises. politics, that's all. You know, so the crazy. pension rises each year in line with inflation, average earnings, or by 2.5%, whichever it is high. It is the highest. It's always the highest possible yes. option. Is it bonkers, Selma? As Steve says. No, I don't. I actually oh. don't think it's bonkers. Oh. And <laughs> one of the things that Steve and I will probably rarely disagree on. And I find it interesting, and I've noted here that it's described as controversial. And I don't think it is controversial because the reason for the triple lock was to ensure that pensioners who can no longer earn and are living off their retirement don't lose out. And I understand that people are talking about the disparity in wealth between those people who are probably sat on properties and had an easier time versus younger people who are now facing job insecurity and a capital insecurity. But that... That wealth isn't realised for a lot of people. It's trapped in their homes and things like that. So I think we have to be really mindful that, you know, as much as it is an issue now, there was a reason for the triple lock, there was a sensible reason for the triple lock, and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater in this instance. But, but you see, it, the, A, it could be realised if they really needed the money, they could sell a property. Young people don't have that option because they don't own a property. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of focus, they haven't done anything about it, but levelling up has largely been about regional inequality, which is a big theme. But generational inequality is huge. And when you're getting these big flat rate pay, universal pay rises to people irrespective of wealth, and then you've got young people who can't contemplate buying a house and renting even is a nightmare, I think it's impossible to justify. But no party would dare challenge it, not actually on your very reasoned grounds, but just the electoral mm. calculation. Mm. Interesting point you raised, though, about that generational inequality, which it's is huge. something that we're going to be discussing yeah. a lot more about, I, I would say, in, in <clears> years <throat> to come. Let's take a look at the mirror and the King's message uh, one year on. This is a year on uh, tomorrow from the passing of uh, Queen Elizabeth II. The message, thank you for your love. Salma. Yes, and um, obviously it's the anniversary and uh, I think lots of people are going to be uh, feeling a, a little bit wistful about Her Late Majesty's reign and you'll see that it's featured uh, on all the front pages uh, today. And I do think that it's important to mark it because even though it's been a year and we've sort of settled into this new reign, I think, <laughs> with great ease, I think people, well, I certainly do, still uh, miss the late Queen. Mm. Uh, and Steve, do, do you think that... That there should be some sort of um, national marking of the anniversary. There doesn't seem to be anything particular. Is there not? I'm, so, I'm sure there would be a lot in the media tomorrow. Um, and I can't believe it's a year ago. I can so vividly remember mm. Liz Truss making a statement in the House of Commons, messages being passed mm. back and forth to Starmer and all the rest of it. But it, what does interest me and well of course it's you know people I understand people feeling sad about it but there was a lot I think of overblown talk about an era ending and a country being traumatized for a long time to come now the country was traumatized in September but more by the Liz Truss era and the budget that all went wrong to be honest I think than the Queen dying in her 90s was she in her 90s mm. um, and it, 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 didn't, it doesn't feel to me as if an era ended and a new one has just begun. It, you know, it might do in other matters of politics and whether we're ending an era of conservative rule and new... But I, I don't feel... Mm. Profound I think a lot change. Of people would differ. No, I'm, I'm sure. I I'm sure. Think, I, thought, I, I think in longer time, historians may judge this differently. I mean, it's a year, but it's still only a, a year. I think in historical terms, I think this will be... A, a, a real a marking of a of a break and yeah. change. I think I think you're right, Salma. Uh, Salma and Steve for the moment.